Please take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read one verse to begin with tonight, but whatever you do, don't put your Bibles away, as we'll be wandering around in a couple of other places in the Bible. So Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, thank you for being so faithful in the middle of the week. God's given us a good day. We thank the Lord for his sweet blessings, and for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise, you see, counting your blessings, naming them one by one, ton by ton, and the Lord is gracious regardless. He is gracious in every way. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, and I want you to read it with me out loud, uh, please, if you would. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And tonight we continue in our study of the doctrines that are found throughout the book of Philippians. And tonight we're going to take a close look at the doctrine of power, the doctrine of power. Father, help us now. I pray that you'd be our master teacher. Make up what I cannot do, and I pray that you'd be the strength that I may not have. With my voice tonight, it kind of surprised me that it cracked there near the end of that song, or through all of it, I guess. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help my voice to stay strong enough to present the Bible study. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And of course, you may be seated. The next doctrine found in the book of Philippians alphabetically is the doctrine of power, P-O-W-E-R. And there are a number of words that are translated uh, in the word of God as the word power. And the one that is used here in Philippians, and this is what you're going to want to circle or at least make note of, the word that is used in Philippians 3.10 is the word dunamis, D-U-N-A-M-I-S, and uh, it is the same word from which we derive the word dynamite. Same word. And uh, it simply means, in its simplest form, strength. It means power. And it means ability. And so God has given us that word here where he says that I want to know Jesus in the power, in the dunamis, in the dynamite of his resurrection. Another word that is used in the New Testament for the word power is found in 20, Matthew 28 and verse 18. Most of you know it by heart. It's part of the Great Commission where the word of God simply says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The word used here is not dunamis. The word that is used here for power is the word exousia. E-X-O-U-S-I-A, if you want to transliterate it into English. And uh, it refers not to strength and power and ability like the other one does. However, this one refers to authority. It, uh, it, uh, it, apply, it applies to right, uh, liberty. Another interesting meaning that it applies to is that of jurisdiction. I love that part of it. Jurisdiction as well as strength is one of the uh, other words that it could be used for, but it's not the word dynamite or dunamis. Let me tell you again, this word does not refer primarily to strength, power, and ability, but to authority, right, liberty, jurisdiction, and strength as well. And uh, this is why Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20 are so important in witnessing and proclaiming the word of God. There are many believers today who are very timid about presenting the gospel or witnessing to anyone, to their family, to their mother, to their father, to their spouse, to their children, to their aunt, to their uncle, to anybody like that, or anybody that they have worked with or anybody they do work with or any neighbor that they may have. And many believers become very timid but the reason we don't have to be timid is because of verse 18, Matthew 29, 18, which says Jesus has authority, Jesus has jurisdiction, and he says, go ye therefore. And remember what we do when we find the word therefore. We find out what it's there for. And it's there for this reason. Jesus said, I have jurisdiction. He said, I have liberty. I have the right. I have authority. I even have the strength. And because I have all of those things, 
I am asking you, I am commending you, I am, uh, I am commanding you to go and tell the gospel where it says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now, I'm going to add a little bit of uh, uh, definition here. Go ye therefore, go ye therefore because I have authority. Go ye therefore because I have the right. Go ye therefore because I have liberty. Go ye therefore because I have jurisdiction. Go ye therefore because I'm the one that has the strength and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. And so therefore we are to teach others, like I'm teaching you tonight, you have jurisdiction. You have authority because Jesus has it, and you have that ability, and you have that liberty, and you have that right to spread the gospel because Jesus gave it to you. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Now, the word that's used in Philippians is the same word that is used in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. And this is what you want to maybe make a cross-reference in your Bible to. The Bible says in Philippians 3.10, the Apostle Paul wanted to know the power of Jesus' resurrection. In Romans 1.16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. When he says it is the power of God, he said it's the dynamite, it's the dunamis, it is the strength, it is all that is supposed to be, it is the power, it is the ability to save, the gospel saves. That's why when you add something to the gospel or take something away from the gospel, it has no authority, it has no power, it has no strength, it has no ability to save. What is the gospel? The Apostle Paul, once again, he defined it in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, where he said very plainly, it is the physical death, the physical burial, and the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And anything added to those things negates the power of the gospel. You add to that lordship, you add to that works, you add to that the law, you add to that church membership, you add to that whatever you have, whatever it might be, you add that to it, you add baptism to it. You're like the church out in, in Boston, Massachusetts, that says that in order for you to be truly saved, you have to be baptized in their church. That's like in 1944 when the Assemblies of God or Church of God put in their doctrinal statement that you are not truly saved unless you speak in tongues. In their doctrinal statement, I wouldn't say that if I hadn't read it with my own eyes. You add anything to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you don't have a saving gospel. And the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For it is the dynamite of God that will save the Jew first and also the Greek. So we have that in the word of God. So what is the doctrine of power as it's found in Philippians? Only one reference, and you have your Bible there already. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, where the apostle Paul writing simply says, that I may know him and the power and the dunamis and the dynamite that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And the apostle Paul spoke of that. That's what he said in Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16, he was not ashamed of the gospel because it was the power of God. Now he says, I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. It's an interesting statement. So I wrote down two lessons, and then I want to share with you another study that will help all of us to understand this thing about power. First of all, knowing Jesus is different than knowing his power. There are a lot of Christians today who claim to know Jesus as their Savior, and I don't doubt their salvation. There are some people who claim to be much more spiritual than I am, and they know if somebody is saved or not. They, they, the only person in this room I can vouch for 120,000% that is saved is Dan Parton. I believe you are. 
I don't have a problem with that. But when I stand before God, I'm not going to give your testimony. I have my own. I know that I'm saved. And so, uh, but you know, it was a number of years later that I found out about the power of God. I'd known Jesus for 59 years, but knowing about his power, it's amazing how the Bible speaks of that. I was speaking one night at a Bible study at Brother Newport's restaurant, or at his motel, I should say, a number of years ago. And I talked about the filling of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and being saved, how we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And one of his fine guests and a good friend of his came up to me and says, I've never heard this before. He said, aren't they the same to be indwelt by the Spirit and to be filled with the Spirit? And I said, oh, sir, no, not at all. He said, I've never heard that teaching in my life. And many believers have not. The Bible talks about Christians coming to a place where they are filled with the power of God. It's not the same as the indwelling Spirit of God. When you got saved, the Spirit of God came in to dwell. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I mean, they people criticize praying and asking Jesus into your heart. They even criticize trusting Christ. They do all these things about your salvation. But the truth of the matter is, the Bible says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. One popular Bible teacher said on his radio broadcast, you cannot geographically put the Holy Spirit anywhere. Well, I disagree with that because the Bible says when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came inside to dwell. The Holy Spirit is in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we understand that. But to know him is different than having or knowing his power. It's like in, uh, I believe it was in Acts chapter 10, when uh, the believers that were baptized and saved under John the Baptist's ministry, uh, they, they were asked if they had received the Holy Spirit since they had been saved. And they looked kind of cross-eyed and said, we, we don't even know what the Holy Spirit is. But the word receive there is not talking about some kind of a supernatural spooky thing. It meant to welcome his ministry. In Timberline Baptist Church, there have been numerous people through the years who have not welcomed the ministry of the Holy Spirit into their Christian life. That's why they just sort of sit around and do nothing. That's why they're not used of God. That's why they don't witness. That's why they don't soul win. That's why they don't uh, study or read their Bibles. That's why they're not faithful in church. That's all these different things. Why? Because they've never welcomed the ministry of the Holy Spirit into their lives. And they need to. And so when they were told they needed to do that, the Bible says as soon as that happened, the power of God came upon them and they were used to testify back in their hometown. It's really an amazing story when you put it in its context, you see. And I know that they were saved. How do I know that? Because John the Baptist preached the same gospel that the rest of the Bible preaches. John 3, 36. Take your Bible. I want you to go to John chapter 3 and verse 36. You know, so many people say that John preached a different gospel. They say that, but they can't prove it scripturally. The Bible says in John 3, 36, and does this sound like the book of 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13? In fact, I'm going to take you there just in a moment. So don't put your Bible away. John 3, 36, the words of John the Baptist. He said, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now go back over to 1 John, if you would please, chapter 5. 1 John, chapter 5, we're verses 11 through 13. Uh, okay, very interesting. Same author. 1 John, chapter 5. Verses 11 through 13, let me read these to you. Most of you have them memorized, where the word of God simply says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Same almost exact words from John 3.36, John the Baptist. And here we have, uh, not, no, I'm sorry, not the same John, different John. Uh, John the Beloved, I'll get it right before it's all said and done. I'm just excited about what I'm saying because they coincide with one another. They go hand in hand, hand in glove, however you'd like to put it. 
And so uh, knowing Jesus as your Savior is not the same as knowing Jesus in his power. And I can prove that from the passage that we read in Philippians 3.10. Was Paul saved? You answer yes or no. Yes. Was he used of God? Yes. Was he a missionary that went around preaching the word of God? Yes. Now notice what he says, that I may know him. He had a desire to know the power of his resurrection. I guess that means there's a lot of Christians who have no idea what that power is. You tell Christians you need to pray for power. They have no idea what you're talking about. Now, I've explained it here and preached it over the years, and so you all know what I'm saying. But yet I wonder how many Christians today, even from Timberline Baptist Church, have asked one time in the last 30 days that God would shed his power upon their life for the service that they are doing. So the first lesson is knowing Jesus is different than knowing his power. Secondly, the same power, the same power that Jesus knew in his resurrection is the power that Christians can know today. I'm going to say it again. The same power, the same dynamite, the same dunamis, the same strength, the same power that Jesus knew in his resurrection is the power that Christians can know today. Very interesting. As I've shared this illustration with you before, as I was walking the sidewalks and streets in Chicago many, many years ago, I remember a young man walked up to me and he asked me if I had been filled with the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in tongues. That's the phraseology that he used. Have you been filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, evidenced by speaking in tongues? And I looked back at him and I said, no, sir. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost by spe and evidenced by speaking the word of God with boldness. And I told him some folks that had gotten saved and asked him about the same. And he basically tucked his tail and his ears back and he walked off. Had the wrong emphasis, you see. Now, the desire of every believer ought to be to know Jesus, not only as Savior, but also as the power giver. That ought, to be, that ought to be your desire. It ought to be my desire, like Paul, that I may know him and the, and the power of his resurrection. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul wanted to know this power, so should we. So what does this power, this dunamis, this dynamite do for us today? Take your Bible. Go back to Psalm 63. I want to show you something. And then we're going to go from there. And then we'll be done and have you home in plenty of time tonight. Psalm 63, look at verse 2. It gives us a glimpse into what the power of God can do, or at least the desire that we have or should have. David had a thirst for God. Oh, Christians, they don't have a thirst for God. They got a thirst for the world. They got a thirst for everything but God. They got a thirst for everything else in their library but the Bible. They got a thirst for everything in their life except that which is godly. Hear me now. Yet David said, to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. You see, David knew the power of God in the past and he wanted to see it again. He knew the power of God in the past and he had a desire to see it again. And of course, that was important. In Psalm 63, in verse 2, we find that David thirsted. He said, I have seen this power in the sanctuary. He said, I want to see it again. I have, I have, that's past tense. And he wanted to see that glory. And he said, to see thy power that I have already seen. He wanted to see it again. Now, God's power, what is it? It's that which enables us to do what we're supposed to do. It's what enables us to do what we're supposed to do. When you think about the 120 believers in the upper room in Acts chapter 2, uh, they were filled with the power of God. And what did they immediately go out and do? They went out and preached and went soul winning and had over 3,000 people saved. They were out doing what they were supposed to do. And so Daniel, when I think about that, I think about how Daniel sought God's power and strength to be faithful when he faced a den of lions. Can you imagine facing a den of lions without God's strength? Can't even imagine what must have, I don't know if Daniel feared or not, but I know my name's Daniel and I would have been afraid. But Daniel, hear me now, Daniel withstood that that entire night and he stayed alive. Moses sought God's power to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. He had to have that. 
to do accomplish the will of God with a, with a, over a million people. It, I'm sure there were grumblers and complainers, and we know about some of them, Jannies and Jambres, and we know about others that followed them, and Moses had to lead all of them. Can you imagine trying to lead them without the power of God on your life to accomplish his will? And then I think about Jeremiah needed the power of God to preach God's word with boldness to a backslidden people. They threw him in a pit. They starved him nearly to death. And when they pulled him out of the pit, they had to put pads under his armpits before they drug him out so that his arms wouldn't come out of socket. And he came out of the whole preaching. Can you imagine that? I'll tell you another reason Christians quit today is because they don't know the power of God. They're too focused on themselves too focused on what they want, you see. These men, Daniel, Moses, and Jeremiah, were focused on doing the will of God. And each and one of us, each and every one of us, needs God's power to perform the task that God has planned for our lives. I named off a few. For example, in soul winning, we need God's power to speak his word without fear and to allow the Holy Spirit to work through this. That's what we pray every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, every Sunday night, asking God for his power. Why? Because I don't have anything good to say unless he tells it to you in your heart. Uh, by the way, so in soul winning, in uh, needing God's power to speak his word without fear, to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. Uh, in our daily activities, we need God's power to resist the temptation that the devil will bring and proclaim the power uh, that God has for you. You need the filling and the power of the Holy Spirit day by day. But yet most Christians, even listening to those online and maybe even in this room, not one time have asked God for his power today, for his dunamis, for his dynamite, for his strength. And I'm trying to emphasize to you that's what every one of us needs to do. God's power will also aid us in our faithfulness, faithful in our Bible reading. Faithful in our prayer life, faithful to soul winning, faithful in our tithing, faithful to those things that God has already admonished us and those things that he's commanded us to do. But here's this, they who thirst pray earnestly for God's power. They who thirst pray earnestly for God's power. When I was a teenager and we came to Colorado and we went swimming in the Water, whatever it was, it was mountain water coming down the side of a mountain. And we all, in those days, I don't think there were near as many bugs in the water as there are today. But it was ice cold. I have no idea how cold it was. All I know is when you jumped in the water, you just, you lost your breath. But I do remember jumping in. And I remember after I got used to it, I remember opening my mouth and drinking ice cold mountain water. Wow. And I just wanted to keep drinking. We had at our campsite, I believe it was up in Granby, there was a rock there that had a pipe sticking out the side of it. It's called an artesian well. And it had constant water flow coming out of it. The water was pure and clear and crystal and ice cold. Say, how cold was it? Well, I washed my hair that morning because I'm a grease pit at night. I'm not careful. And I remember sticking my head under that and having to take a breath. But I remember getting my I remember getting my herbal essence shampoo, Garden of, of Earthly Delights, okay? And I remember pouring it in my hand and putting it on my head to wash my hair. And the, the shampoo, it got firm. <laughs> I had to work it into my scalp to warm it up because it was so cold. But I got my hair clean. And uh, I really honestly did. But boy, that was cold. But I remember drinking from that artesian well just not wanting to put the glass down, not wanting to take my hands away and just drink and drink deeply. I did that because I was thirsty. And those who thirst will pray earnestly for God's power. Dr. Hiles often stated that he reminded himself daily to pray for God's power. He said he did it no less than seven times a day. And he had the words, I've told you this, and I've told you what I've practiced in the past. He had the words, pray for power, in his Bible. Had them on a mirror, had them in his car, had them on his briefcase, and had them throughout his home to remind him to pray for God's power. You know why he did that? Because he was thirsty. Because he was thirsty. And the Apostle Paul said, I want to know him, not just as my Savior, he said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. 
What is the power of his resurrection? Can I say it again? Romans 1.16. It is the power of God unto salvation. He became an effective speaker because of the power of God. And so my desire tonight in this Bible study is that, oh, that we would thirst for God's power and see our lives changed as God begins to use us for his honor and for his glory. How important is that? It's very, very important. So I want to ask you tonight, are you thirsty? I trust that you are. And if you're not, you need to get that way. You need to get thirsty. And think about how long it's been since maybe the Lord's used you in some special way. Maybe getting thirsty is going to fix that.